Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, before we do get started, I want to encourage you to check out my uh, store, store.greatdetectives.net. We have five uh, novels in paperback for sale, and they make great gifts for fans of mystery or superheroes. Uh, Slime Incorporated being a detective novel and the other being superhero comedy novels and also can be used uh, and uh, given to libraries or little free libraries. So check out store.greatdetectives.net. Now from May 28th of 1945, here's today's episode of Michael Shane, Recreate a Murder. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Many an exciting case crosses the desk of our detective friend, Mike Shane. Right now, there's something special on that desk. Bending over it are Mike, his assistant, Phyllis Knight, and Inspector Faraday. Shh, watch. Mike frowns grimly. Then slowly, carefully, he turns the next page of Lear magazine. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Mike, where did they get that picture of you? <laughs> oh, no. A day from the life of Mike Shane, San Francisco's sophisticated sleuth. Oh, anything for a story. If they were going to write about me, why didn't they interview what me? What are you kicking about? It's publicity. That super sleuth, that maestro of the clue, oh. that glamour boy of detectives. Yeah. Hey, hey, here's a picture of both of us. Hmm. Handsome detective inspects scene of society murder. Oh. The willowy damsel on his left is Mike's current heart in... Hey, current... I like that. Oh, sure, sure. It seems Mike is a wizard with the ladies. But read all about it on page seven. I'm I packing will. my bags and heading for the mountains. <laughs> Spare the suitcase. This may be a client. Oh. Hello? Yes, this is his secretary. I'm sorry, he's busy right now. Who is it? Oh? Oh, yes, mm. yes. When? Who is it? Shh. Tonight. 7.30. Well, I'm sure he'd be delighted to come. Honey, honey, yes. I'd be delighted to what? what? Shh. Certainly. Certainly I'll tell him. Thank you very much, Miss Melton. Goodbye. Now what have you got me into? Your magazine story is paying dividends already, Mr. Shane. You and I are going to attend one of the exclusive parties of Miss Sherry Melton. Oh, no, not that sob, sister. But, of course, she gives such different parties. And her newspaper column, why, she might write you up, too. Yeah, well, I can skip that. <laughs> Kids, I don't like this setup. I don't like it at all. Even say that again. No, Mike, you don't understand. I'm invited to the same party. You? Huh? Yeah, she called me up. I told her I liked parties, but being inspector of homicide, I never know about my evenings. Then she said I had to come because she was going to recreate a murder. Oh, one of those things. Mike, I'm leery of this sort of stuff. Something always goes wrong. What do you mean? It seems someone always gets hurt. Well, but why is she doing it? What's her reason? What goes? Not what, darling. Who goes? And the answer? We do. You know something? This is a real party, and it's oh. such an attractive house. Don't you think so, huh, Mike? Uh, my collar's too tight. I, I told you I can't wear a tuxedo. I feel like a pallbearer. You don't look ah, like Mr. Shea. Uh -oh. Why, you're much handsomer than in that magazine. <laughs> you should wear a tuxedo on every case. <laughs> uh, Miss Melton, this is my... Uh, <clears throat> well, this is Miss Phyllis Knight. How do you do, Miss Melton? Oh, yes, yes. Well, come on into the lounge. I want you to meet everybody. <laughs> You know, uh, the party tonight is just a mad inspiration. The other day I was having lunch with Freddie. Oh, you know Freddie, the senator from Kansas or uh, Florida or someplace. And, and I said, darling, I'm going to give a party and... Oh, wait, here, here's a man I want you to meet. 
Uh, Sherwood. Yes, my little butterball. Uh, Miss Knight, this is Sherwood Armstrong. Oh, the mystery story writer. How do you do? <laughs> Rather bored up to this moment, but now I see possibility. Uh, 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 Sherwood, <laughs> before you ask her out onto the balcony to talk over her story ideas, you better check with Mr. Shane here. <laughs> I'm glad to know you, Mr. Armstrong. I wish I could say the same, sir. I've always admired your ability, and now you're... Good taste. Oh, in, uh... go away with you, you wretch. <laughs> I want these people to meet somebody really important. Well, I'll be back. Oh, uh, there's our man, the one with the big glasses and bushy hair. Hmm? Uh, Dr. Kaler. Yes? Dr. Kaler, Michael Shane and Miss Phyllis Knight. How do you How do? do? How do you How do, you do, do Mr. Shane. Uh, Dr. Kaler studied psychology in Vienna, and he writes all those fascinating books on dreams and why people commit murder. Oh, Miss Melton, please. Of course, we've all heard of you, Doctor. One of our best criminologists. Mike, you must read some of his books. Mm, yes, I must. Uh, Sherry, oh, Sherry, uh, may I see you a moment, please? Oh, Ray, I almost forgot you. Uh, Ray and I used to work on the same newspaper in Chicago. Uh, look, darling, I want you to meet a publisher. Dr. Kaler, I'd love to read some of your books. You must tell me which one to start on first. You are very kind, madam, but I'm afraid you would find them very technical and perhaps dull. Oh, no, no. If I can't understand what you mean, I'll ask Mike to explain it to me. He's a wonderful student, you know. You should see his library. You oh, really should, Doctor. Huh? He's got a complete file of Esquire. Faraday. Well, I was wondering where you were. Oh, oh get you. Tuxedo and patent leather shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, Doctor, how are you coming with that next book? Very well indeed, thank you. Well, then you two know each oh, other. Oh, sure. Huh? Dr. Kaler's helped me out with several cases. Now, jealous, are you? Oh, well, of course I'm not. Hey, wait a minute. Miss Melton's trying to say something. We are now going to have a buffet supper. <laughs> After that, I have a surprise for you. I won't tell you what it is, but I'll give you a hint. It's murder. <laughs> so much to eat. Quiet, everybody. Quiet, please. I brought all of you upstairs to this bedroom because we're going to play a game. Oh, I don't care what Faraday says, Mike. This is going to be fun, huh? Now, I want four of my guests to pay particular attention. Inspector Faraday. Yes. Mr. Shane. Yes. Dr. Kaler. I'm ready. And Sherwood Armstrong. <laughs> uh, Sherwood, will you look around this room and tell us what you see <laughs> besides people? Well, yeah, a uh, double bed. Mm -hmm. right. Nightstand. Mm -hmm. Telephone. Mm-hmm. Two chairs and a bureau. <laughs> yes. Well. Does uh, does anything about it look familiar to you? No. How about you, Dr. Kaler? It's a complete mystery. Inspector Faraday? Well, the arrangement and spacing of furniture does look familiar to me. Reminds me of the bedroom of a man who was recently murdered. You're right, Inspector. The bedroom of John Hines. Yes. Oh, oh yes, yes. I've arranged everything to duplicate his bedroom. And tonight, we're going to reenact the murder. Mike, that killing's never been solved. As you all know, I like to give unique parties. So I've invited four famous crime experts here tonight to give us their own solutions of this unsolved mystery. Mr. Shane, do you know the details of the case? Well, fairly well. It, uh, it happened about two months ago. John Himes was a rich old miser. He was found shot to death in his bedroom with the doors and windows locked from the inside. The only suspect was his secretary, and uh, he had a watertight alibi. Is that right, Inspector? It is. All right. Now, you, Dr. Kaler, will be John Hines. Oh. Uh, lie down on the bed, please. But, uh, <laughs> I did, oh, Milton. now, hurry up, hurry up. Don't be so shy, oh, Doctor. All right. <laughs> and, and you, Sherwood, you will be the killer. Oh. Stand outside the door till we call you. Well, this is very exciting. Yes. Now, as Inspector Faraday tells us what happened that night... Dr. Kaler and Sherwood will, wa will act it out for us. Now, if you please, Inspector. Well, it's about midnight. John Hines is in bed, probably asleep. Doors and windows are locked. Somebody comes to his hall door. All right, Sherwood. Hines thinks it's his secretary. He gets out of bed, goes to the door. He unlocks and opens it. The killer enters. At first, there's no struggle. No outcry. Oh, careful, Dr. Kaler. Hmm? Put on your glasses. You can't see where you're going. Of course not, madam. Neither could Mr. Himes. If he had worn his glasses, he would have seen it was not his secretary. Correct, doctor. The killer advances into the room, demands the old man hand over the cash he has hidden in the house. The old fellow refuses. The killer insists. He raises his gun and then... <laughs> what? Mike! <a> Mike! <laughs> Mike! 
We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane and Phyllis Knight in just a moment. Simply because your automobile engine is rated at a certain horsepower doesn't mean it's delivering that rate. Worn or burned out spark plugs, for example, can actually cut down the horsepower of your engine even at full throttle. You see, high compression engines demand complete instant firing. If any of your spark plugs are worn or improperly adjusted, you get a weak sputtering fire which fails to ignite all the gasoline. So serious is this loss that engineering tests prove faulty spark plugs can waste one tankful of gasoline out of every ten. So, friends, if you're not absolutely certain your spark plugs are firing properly, why not play safe and have your Union Oil Minuteman check them? The performance of each separate plug is accurately measured on a scientific tester, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and adjust them to the proper setting. If they're burned or worn out, he can furnish you with a new set. Union Oil Spark Plug Service takes but a few minutes and costs but a few cents, a cost you'll soon save in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. And remember, next Monday night, Michael Shane comes to you one half hour earlier, 8 o'clock instead of 8.30. An unsolved murder is being reenacted at Sherry Melton's society party. Suddenly, at the very climax of the scene... Mike! Mike! Everybody stay where you are! Who fired that shot? Armstrong did. He had the gun. I saw him. Don't be ridiculous, Ray. I was just faking a gun with my pipe. Please, is anyone hurt? Oh, no, no. Only your dignities. Four famous crime experts, and they don't know a fake gunshot from the real thing. What? You mean it was a phony? Of course. I slapped this yardstick here on the bed pillow. Oh, oh for heaven's sake. Very save. amusing. A perfect example of mass psychology and suggestion. Now let's get on with the crime. You've been shot, Dr. Kaler, so stretch out on the floor. Yes, perhaps like this beside the bed. Oh, that's perfect. You make a very convincing corpse, Doctor. <laughs> And now, Inspector, if you'll just go on. Well, there's nothing more to tell. The killer didn't find the money he was after, so he slipped out of the house again. Perfect crime, eh? Well, if the police couldn't solve it, I can. Are you right? Right? Yeah. Oh, at yeah. least I will in my next book. Oh. Oh. That's where a writer has it all over. The oh, we'll solve it, Mr. Armstrong. In fact, just this evening, I got a fresh angle on the case, which I can't tell anyone yet. Wow, that means a neat headline. Sherry Melton's party gives police answer to a puzzling murder. Oh, always the news, Hawk Ray. But meanwhile, let's play my game. Hmm? You four masterminds have 30 minutes to solve the mystery. You're each to go to a different room so you can't compare notes. In 30 minutes, we'll vote who has the most exciting solution. And the prize? Champagne, of course. <laughs> Up, Mike, we've got just ten minutes to oh, go. Oh, honey, of all the dimwit stunts, this is it. Come on, come We on. can spend all night dreaming up solutions, but none of them will be right. Crimes aren't solved by slapstick. It's just a game. Oh. Think up something really dramatic. I want you to be brilliant tonight, Mike. We've got a famous criminologist and a mystery story writer. Show them what we can do. Oh, uh, we? <laughs> what was that? Huh? Mike, what was that? Sounded like outside. Come on, come yeah. on. Mike, it's an accident or something outdoors. Let's go. I'm coming, too. Well, it can't be an auto smash-up. There's nothing on the street. Oh, it sounded closer to the house. Anyway, maybe here on the ground. Can I help, gentlemen? I don't know, Doctor. we got to search the garden. i got a flashlight in my car. So have I, Inspector. I'll get it. Okay, let's spread out. Search both sides of the house. Right, I'll take the left wing here. No, no, Angel, not you. Not but, Mike, I want to. No, no, you're not going to prowl around through bushes in the dark. Now, go on, go on, beat oh, it. All right, you old worrywart. Who's that? Answer me. Who is it? An elk looking for his lodge. Oh, Faraday. Well, did you find anything on your side? Nah, too dark. Ray was supposed to bring me his flashlight. I got tired of waiting. Well, come on, let's go get our own flashlights. Coming, coming. Maybe we're just chasing our own tails. This is another one of that woman's party gags. It isn't. It isn't, Faraday. Huh? 
What I just found doesn't belong at any party. Found what? On the running board of Faraday's car. A dead body. <laughs> Stand back, everybody. We can't see what we're doing. Hmm. Looks like he was knocked out first and then strangled with his own tie. Oh, but who would want to kill Ray and why? And what was he doing on my running board? He said he was going to get the flashlight from his car. Well, that's fairly simple, Inspector. Miss Melton says that's his sedan right behind yours. Looks like a riddle. But it's the same make, model, and year. Well, sure, he thought he was getting into his own car. Did, uh... Did any of you people see uh, anybody come near this car? Not me. Only Miss Knight. We were all looking for the cause of that crash. Oh, oh, I forgot. I found the cause. Huh? H- here's what's left of it. Mm. Mm. Looks like a table lamp. An expensive one, too. It was at the end of the hall upstairs. Somebody must have thrown it out the window. The cook found it in a flower box. That's it. Smashed on purpose to get us outdoors. But, but why? I'm the only person Ray knew in town... I invited him here to the party so he, well, so he wouldn't be lonely. I invited him to to his death. No one saw the killer. No one has a motive. Where do we go from here? First off to the telephone. I got to call headquarters. Uh, Just a minute, uh, Inspector. Phil, stay here and see that nobody touches the body. All right, Mike. Now, Faraday, what is it you know about the murder of John Hines? What is it the killer's afraid of? Huh? I don't get you, Mike. Did you take a good look at Ray Rogers' body just now? Of course. No, no, you didn't. Not a good look. Ray Rogers was just about your height. He had the same stooped shoulders, same gray hair. Holy jumpy. And he was getting into my car. Exactly. Somebody made a mistake, Inspector. Somebody wants to kill you. This is the window right here, Mr. Shane. You can see it's still raised. Mm -hmm. The lamp fell into the flower box on the ground floor. Yeah, but it's so smashed up. And you've handled it, I guess fingerprints are out. But we know that the killer was here on the second floor. Miss Melton, can you place everybody at the moment you heard the crash? Well, no, I I was in my bedroom fixing my hair. And where is your bedroom? Uh, Through this door here. Oh, but Sherwood, you were in the room across the hall. Take it easy, Sherry. You put me in there because of the contest. I was cooking up a solution for the murder. Uh, I mean, of John Himes. Well, how about you, Dr. Kaler? You were in the next bedroom down the hall. I cannot oblige, madam. I also was deep in thought. Well, I, I guess no one saw the man then. The inspector and Mr. Shane were downstairs, so were all the other guests. As a writer of murder thrillers, I'd say the man came here with no idea of killing. Hmm? Ray was strangled with his own tie, hmm. so the man was without a gun. You assume the unknown, Mr. Armstrong. The victim was strangled, which is a masculine technique in murder. Therefore, a clever woman with a strong arm might choose that very method. Yes, yes, a red herring. That's very clever, Dr. Kelly. Uh, Miss Melton, I know you're famous for unusual parties, but why did you decide to reenact a murder tonight? Why, why it was just an inspiration of mine. And th- then Sherwood suggested we do the case of John Himes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I interviewed the old man once, and yes, I even, even covered his inquest for my paper. I see. Sherwood Armstrong suggested it. When we entered your, your contest... You asked all of us if the room and furniture looked familiar. You, Mr. Armstrong, said not at all. Well, that... that was just an act. Sherry and I knew you'd made sketches of the actual scene, and we wanted to trip you up if we could and and get a laugh. But why did you pick the particular murder of John Himes? I knew him. He was a fan of mine, read all my books. So you and Miss Melton both knew him. That is hardly a crime, Inspector. I, too, knew Mr. Himes. We were members of the same club. However, it is disturbing that they should choose that particular unsolved crime. As a psychologist, I know the subconscious desire of every killer to confess his murder. Some return to the scene, some even talk about it to strangers. The criminal subconscious feels cheated of the drama, the notoriety which comes with his confession or capture. Look here, I don't like the drift of this talk. Well, I apologize, my friend. I'm always going off into a lecture. I'm sure neither of you is guilty. None of us is. We have no motives. Ah, here come my boys. Well, it's about time. You ready, Mike? All set. Honey, get your coat. Are we leaving? Yes, we are. The answer to Ray Rogers' death isn't here. It's in a house that's been padlocked for two months. (coughs) 
place is dusty. Did you expect John Himes' ghost to meet us with a vacuum cleaner? If I remember right, this is the bedroom. Yep, it is. We've left everything in place. Nothing's been changed. Uh, the old guy was a miser, all right. Not enough furniture for a dollhouse. Inspector, you told us tonight you had a new idea about this case. What was it? Uh, that's the blood stain over there, Mike, in front of the telephone stand. Inspector, what was it? Maybe it's our solution. Don't bother him, honey. Hey, there's the print of a shoe here on the edge of the blood. Yeah. The killer made it. Wore tennis shoes. We try to trace it. How about fingerprints? All identified. Well, except for one. Probably an old print. Maybe some visitors. Couldn't match it up with our files anyway. You said his secretary lived with Himes. You sure of his alibi? Positive, Phil. Nice young fella. He got a phone call in the afternoon that his uncle was dying down at Carmel. He got to Carmel in the evening and it turned out to be a fake call. The murderer just wanted him out of the way. Well, he could have sneaked back that night and... No, no, he had witnesses. In fact, he telephoned long distance about midnight to tell Himes he'd be back in the morning. Yeah, I remember it now. The operator said somebody answered the phone but didn't say a word. Just hung up. Yeah. We figured the murderer picked up the receiver to hear who was calling. He cleaned the receiver afterwards and put it back. That's when he stepped in the blood. Uh, it doesn't add up, though, Inspector. There's only one shoe print. Now, he couldn't possibly stand here and reach over to the phone on that table. It's too far. Well, does it matter? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me try something. If I put one foot on the blood stain here and then my knee on this chair, I can... Yeah. Now I can reach it. Say, come to think of it, that's where we found the stray fingerprints. Right where you got your hands right now. On the back of that chair. Okay, now we're clipping coupons. That fingerprint belongs to the killer of John Himes and Ray Rogers. All right, but whose print is it? The inspector doesn't know. Well, we'd better know, and in a hurry. The murderer tried to get Faraday once tonight. He'll try again, and the next time, who knows? <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the advantages of Union Oil's spark plug service. Now, as a featured part of this service, the Minutemen will also inspect your ignition cables. These are the small, thin wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. Naturally, if any of them are defective, even brand new spark plugs won't receive enough juice for proper firing. In other words, a faulty ignition cable will leak electricity. So for a complete, accurate check on your car's firepower, have the Minutemen service your spark plugs and ignition cables. You'll notice the increased power and snap in your engine as soon as you drive away. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. It is midnight. Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are at headquarters. Mike and Phyllis are bent over a desk studying a police file. No luck, kids. Huh? Boys, recheck those fingerprints. None on record. But we've got to have it, Faraday. Your life may depend on it. All right, there are. 130 million people in the United States. Shall I ask every one of them to mail me their prints? Oh, easy, Inspector, easy. Well, we're stymied. That's all there is to it. Well, we'll keep on trying. Phil and I have been going through the coroner's report here. So far, nothing new. The bullet entered skull immediately below right ear. Death was almost instantaneous. Deceased fell to floor in position shown in photographs. The eyeglasses held in his left hand were crushed and embedded in his palm. In mm -hmm. the opinion of the doctors... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it. What was Himes doing with the eyeglasses in his hand? He was nearsighted. Oh, we covered that at the party tonight, Mike. He probably never put his glasses on. That's why he mistook the killer for his own secretary. Why do we have to assume that? Why not the opposite? Opposite? What do you mean? Well, perhaps Himes was taking his glasses off. So what? Does it make any difference? Does it make any difference? Look, Faraday, look. All we need to get this killer are three things. A pair of tennis shoes, a set of fingerprints, and an address. Mm, that's all. Just sit down and write ourselves a letter to Santa Claus. No, no. We'll get the fingerprints from the police files. But we just looked. Not everywhere, Inspector. We'll get the address from the phone book and the tennis shoes at that address. I don't know what it is. 
Well, party doesn't sound quite as lively as it did a few hours ago. Mike, that paper sack, everybody will know their shoes. Carry it like a bottle of champagne. Shh, quiet, quiet. Here comes our hostess. Well, at last. We thought you'd never get back. My guests want to go home. Oh, they can shortly. Uh, where are they? In the bar, most of them. Sheer escapism, gentlemen. Personally, I prefer this book of poetry. Shakespeare's sonnets. How nice. What's wrong with a copy of Sherwood Armstrong? Any luck, boys? Well, I think so. How about it, Inspector? Dr. Kaler, you're an expert on fingerprints. I have in these cards two sets of fingerprints. Will you examine them and tell us if they're identical? Uh, certainly. Hmm. This whirl here and the lines. Huh. They're identical. Do you recognize them? No. Mr. Armstrong, do you recognize them? Well, I... No, I don't. And Miss Melton? Why, no, but I'm not an expert. May I ask where you got these prints? From the back of a chair in the bedroom of John Himes. Oh. The second card is from the file of honorary members of the police force. Oh, I mean, isn't that strange? You were about to say, Miss Melton, that you too have been an honorary policeman for the past three years? I, uh, yes. Oh, but surely you don't think that I... I never did like the idea of your parlor entertainment, Miss Melton. When I came here tonight, I expected that something might go wrong. Or at least that the murder of John Himes might be present. Now, just a minute, Inspector. I think I you're going to... I told you people I had a new angle on the murder. Actually, I didn't know a thing. It's an old trick making the murderer think you have the answer. He'll stampede and give himself away. Which is exactly what happened. The killer tried to remove the Inspector, but he made a mistake out there in the dark. He got the wrong man. Wrong man? Now, I have here in this paper bag a pair of tennis shoes worn by the murderer. May I... Uh, May I ask you, gentlemen, what size shoes you wear? A number nine. Also a nine. I see. But uh, the night you killed John Himes, you wore an eight and a half, Dr. Kaler. The night I... Oh. Sir, this is a joke. Is anyone laughing? The sole of this left shoe shows traces of blood. The blood of John Himes. The blood you stepped in when you answered the phone in that bedroom. But no, they are not my shoes. I do not play tennis. You bought them because they were noiseless, Doctor. We found them in the closet in your room at your club. And the fingerprints are from your honorary police card. You convicted yourself, Doctor, when you reenacted the crime. You pointed out to us that Himes mistook the visitor for his own secretary because he hadn't put on his glasses. The crime was so vivid in your memory that you unconsciously repeated it to the last detail. Your own subconscious was what trapped you, Doctor. <laughs> Golly, Mike, I wish that magazine had waited a few days. But it really has something to write about. Hmm? Mike Shane outwits famed criminologists. Well, I'd say the honors go equally to our friend and companion, Inspector Fowler. Oh, oh, I don't do? know. But all I did was to smoke him up with a big wise act. No, it gets me, kids, is why Kaler did it. He hardly knew John Himes. He had no motive. He told us the motive, honey. His own vanity. The great criminologist commits the perfect crime. He, uh, he, 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 it's like a case out of the, the last book he published. Mike Shane, you didn't tell me you'd read any of his books. Oh, every one of them, honey. And I can show you a book at my apartment he wrote back in 1937, and on one of the pages I scribbled, someday this man's going to commit a murder. Oh, and I thought I was the only one who suspected him. What? Huh? Oh, now look, Angel. Why, you were draped on Kayla's arm all evening. What, Dr. Kayla, how clever of you. Shakespeare's sonnets. How utterly wonderful. Oh, I was just playing up to him. I knew. Oh, oh, oh. you did? <laughs> How? Mike Shane, I suspect any man who parts his hair in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> This is Mike Shane again. And this is Phyllis. Both reminding you that next Monday evening we'll be on the air one half hour earlier. Same night, same station. Remember, won't you? Mike and Phyllis at 8 o'clock next Monday. Good, Good night, night, all. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective. Starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. 
Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series. Oh, and a madam's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, uh, a very good uh, mystery. Kind of a little bit of a cheat on the first ep- uh, first uh, commercial break uh, cliffhanger with the gunshot. But they needed to take that break and they needed to figure out something to make sure that we would still be listening when they got back. It was kind of interesting in the end to hear uh, Phyllis Knight... Uh, prominently featured in the credits. Uh, now, this is maybe because Kathy Lewis is playing the role and she's such a uh, good actress. And also, I think, probably a fairly prominent one to bump up the uh, billing. At any rate, that'll do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for The Crime Files of Flamond. And next Monday, it's another episode of Michael Shane. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become